Call the special meeting of the City Council to order for Monday evening, December 3rd, 2018. Please stand as we salute our American flag and remain standing as well. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Councilors and guests, I'd, I'd ask you to remain standing so that we can take a moment of silence like the, the rest of the uh, country has done and other elected officials within other states as well. And as I was leaving the house, I shut the TV off to see that Mr. Bush has arrived in Washington. And I think it's only proper that we, we take that moment of silence to honor the 41st President of the United States. As I've always said, it doesn't matter what party affiliation we are, but um, he was a very good president and an honorable one and, and always a gentleman to the presidency of the United States. So at this time, I'd like to take a moment of silence for President George Walker Bush. And may he rest in peace. And also before we sit down, Mr. O'Donnell is not with us this evening, our tax successor. And as you know, his brother Michael passed away a week ago. And today was the burial for his, his brother brought home from, uh, I believe he's in Colorado, and he's brought home here to the city to be uh, buried in the place that he was born. So. Take a moment of silence for uh, uh, Michael. His name was Michael O'Donnell. And our sympathy to John, his wife Lisa, and the whole O'Donnell family. And to all our Jewish families and friends and all from the city of Brockton, happy Hanukkah as we begin the holiday, as we begin a holiday season. Mr. Clerk. We have the call of the meeting. Accepted and placed on file. We have the officer's return of notice. Accepted and placed on file. And the hearing in order that the city council hereby determines the percentages of the local VAX levy in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 56, to be borne by each class of real property as defined in Section 2A of Chapter 59 and personal property and any other matters that pertain to this council. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And at this time, what we're going to do is have our public hearing, which is going to allow those that are here uh, from public to come up and um, say a few few words. When you do come up, we ask that uh, I don't see where uh, I believe the microphone is right over in that direction, right over there to my right. Uh, so when you come up, you state your name and address uh, to the clerk. And this is for us. Um, um, to hear what, if anybody has anything to say in regards to what we'll be doing here this evening, which is to set the tax rate, which is something that has to be done each and every year at this time, not just by the city of Brockton, but by every city throughout this Commonwealth and every town as well. Um, it's based upon the rules and regulations of the Department of Revenue, and uh, it's something that we love to do, but not love to do, but we have to do. So um, in any case, um, at this point in time, I'm gonna declare the hearing open. <coughs> And if there's anybody here that wishes to be heard, I'd ask that they come up. The microphone again is over over to my right there and state your name and address to the clerk and, and um, your comments will be taken under advisement. This is not for deliberation, it's for under advisement. So if anyone wishes to come up, please do so now. Hi, Good my name's Diane Ransom, and I live on Galen Street, in which I brought this uh, really quickly, quickly drawn up somewhat of a map of my area where I live. This would be Galen Street, this would be Center Street, this would be Crescent, and in between there, Brockton Hospital to Massasoit. And if you want to come look at this, because I don't know where to set it, where everybody can see it, I do have a um, color key to go with this. If I read the color key, you'll get an idea. All this red on this chart 
belongs to signature health care properties, which is pro private, and they don't pay no taxes. They take up a lot of space on my end of town. I have some purple markings on there on commercial buildings and businesses that are not open, not being used, that has been built, which in fact, because they have been built and parking lots added on in blue, there's just from my house, my backyard, and that area there, there's four, uh, seven blue H's for houses whose property values have gone down because now their backyard over their fence is all parking when it didn't used to be. Now you can look over and see them playing in their pool and stuff like that, you know, that ch watch their children. Okay, then I have some yellow, which um, it's two shades of yellow because I'm not sure what tax this might, they, these might fall in. Massasoit, the public buildings, um, the um, nursing home there on Beaumont Street. I, I don't know if those are tax, you know, free. The church down there, I don't know. I have um, green around the businesses there, which there's a lot that are open. Um, I have red, yeah, I, oh, pink, pink, right here. From just before Galen Street starts, Galen, right here, all the way up to Quincy Street on both sides, it's the only residential house. There's one more business where the top floor is a home and the business is underneath. Over here on Crescent Street, pretty much the same thing all the way up to you get to Quincy Street from down by McDonald's before the East Side Plaza, which, yeah, more empty buildings. What my point is, is that property values shouldn't have to pick up, <coughs> you know, homeowners shouldn't have to pick up for slag for businesses that ain't running. It's not the residents' fault that these buildings aren't filled. There's something fundamentally wrong with the city when they can't attract businesses to fill these and pay the taxes. Um, I know it's hard. I stopped paying taxes almost four years ago on a property on the north side. I can tell you on every side of town you find situations like this where there is actually more more of this than there are homes, you know? I mean, I think the problem lies with attracting families that will work here, that will spend money here, that will want to raise a family here, which means, I don't, I don't know, I think you need more manufacturing, I, I think you need to do something different, but I don't think that the poor people that work and come home after days like over the weekend and have to drain their cellars and wet vacuum and all that. I mean, foundations cracking, just about the whole city floods. I've seen houses that were in their yard were pools and after a big rain, their pool was inside of a pool. You know what I mean? It's bad. And I really don't think that, um, I know you already talked to the to business people before you came to us, you know? I mean, I, I'm just hoping that you guys might have a little bit of mercy on these people. A lot of these people are elderly. They might now just own their home because they worked all of their life and now they're on a fixed income and that's what they're paying their taxes with. Um, I know I was a single mom splitting taxes on a shared property with my brother who was single. And I didn't live in the one family house. And that was tough right there. I mean, there's a lot of situations. And a, a lot of these people, I mean, you have to work multiple jobs. You have multiple family members that can't even move out. You know, whether they're college educated or not, there's just no way. If you work 40 hours a week at $10 an hour after taxes, 
you might bring home about $1,200 a month, which would be about a, uh, the rent on a two-bedroom apartment, and that's not counting all your other utilities. Then residential homeowners, not only do they have their water and their regular taxes, you know, they have homeowners insurance and, and maintenance and all kinds of things. So I just, I just felt like I needed to come here and, and stand up for those who couldn't be here to, to, to voice these kind of concerns. Thank you. Thank you, very good, thank you. Go right ahead. Hello. Uh, Hello. My, my name is Elaine Donovan at 42 Thatcher Square. And I feel compelled to remind this city council that you're elected to represent the residents of Brockton and that the needs, wants, and concerns of residents should be your highest priority, even on issues where the, the opinion of the residents may not match your own personal preference such as the case with retail marijuana, which Brockton voters approved. Yet this council has done everything in its power to prevent or delay this extremely lucrative business from ever getting into Brockton. Meanwhile, towns where retail stores opened are raking in literally hundreds of thousands of dollars every day. It is unconscionable for you to even entertain the thought of raising our taxes until retail pot ordinances and zoning are finalized and the stores are open. The, the city council should be facilitating, <coughs> not obstructing, new revenue streams in the city. Until that happens, you have no business continuing to raise our taxes, and I hope voters are paying attention to your actions and decisions come the next election day. So basically, in short, no pot, no tax hikes. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I own uh, Liberty Printing. I'm on 99 Lawrence Street in Brockton. Yes. <clears throat> My business has been in existence since 1901. And we've always operated in Brockton. We do a lot of printing for the city of Brockton. And uh, I am really uh, agree with that lady over there. I've watched a lot of businesses closed in the city. I don't know what's wrong with the city that they don't go after people to come here. I've watched, believe me, I've been around for a long time. I've watched uh, almost all the printing companies in Brockton go out. I've watched businesses around us on Lawrence Street go out. And I think that the, the um, and I don't know exactly, I know you people have a different focus right here because you're setting the taxes, but there's got to be somebody in this town um, and I think it's the mayor's job to get more businesses in this town because that's, I understand what the people that live in this town, it's hard for them, it's hard for us business people too because I've watched my taxes climb, climb and climb and, and I really don't get anything. I don't even get, I don't even get rubbish pickup and, and, and they've put uh, uh, different kinds of things like we had to put a, a dumpster in and then we had to build a fence around it and we had to and and nobody cares if people ride around the city of Brockton and dump all their construction thing beside my dumpster no one comes back and picks it up for us we have to do we have to dispose of it um, ourselves I'm a little <laughs> nervous um, but I really think that um, being in here in this town my, um, um, my business, I don't think there's any business in Brockton that have been in the town since 1901 and been in a running, uh, my shop is like a, it can be like a museum because I have pieces in my shop that have been there f forever, you know. So uh, I really would like to see something to get more businesses going, to get more, get, get some industry into this town to help with the tax revenue instead of relying on the businesses that are here and the property owners that have got a, we've got a burden on us. And that's why a lot of people get out of Brockton because they don't have anything offered to them. The businesses are moving out. I've had, I've had people come to me and say, why don't you get out of Brockton? But 
I mean, we've got a long history here. We do a, we've got a, a working relationship with the city of Brockton, you know, that we've been doing for years. And so we want to stay here. We want this town. I, I've watched Brockton, you know, I mean, I understand that things change and different cultures come in, and I'm all for that. But I, I saw what Brockton used to be. It used to be a place to be proud of. We were the shoe city of the world. <coughs> And now, when you talk about Brockton, people think about people getting killed in the streets, murder and stuff. That's not a town to be proud of. And, and I feel bad because there's a lot, a lot of good people in this city that have worked hard and a lot of cultures that work hard. And, and I'd like to see Brockton come up and be a, something to be proud of again. All of our kids should be proud of where they come from. You know, um, and I say, you know, Brockton, you don't, you, there's, there's goodness in Brockton. So I hope you people can do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? In? Jim Leonard, 72 Glen Ave. Good evening. This lady talked about businesses coming in. Businesses come in, and you give them a 15, 20 year tax abatement. One week, you're talking about giving a tax abatement to a guy that's going to build some apartments, and the next month, you, next week, you're talking about raising taxes. What are you going to do when there's nobody able to pay their taxes? And most of us are senior citizens. Democratic Party thinks that 76 is the maximum age in the United States. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh -uh. Counselors, thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Chris Cooney. I'm president of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. Good evening. Have Chris. been for 21 years and I represent about 1,000 companies in Brockton and the surrounding communities. Um, you know, what I'm hearing here tonight is really a lack of understanding uh, of how the tax system works and what has been going on here for the last 20 years. Uh, what I would say from the business community to folks that are complaining about the residential tax rate is you're welcome. Uh, this, the businesses in this city, the ones that are left, pay a 1.75% uh, rate much higher than the residential. We subsidize the residential rate. If you look at your homes and you compare it to every surrounding town, you pay about 30 to 35 percent less on the same property in every surrounding town. And I can tell you this, and I've had real estate folks here, and you know it, I've had attorneys here from the city, and when they look at comparatives, and I, I, you know, I compliment John O'Donnell and, and uh, Jay, Jay uh, Condon for this report each and every year, because it highlights the distinction between Brockton and the surrounding towns. If you look at a commercial tax uh, burden on a 10,000 square foot property in the town of Easton in the industrial park and compare it to a 10,000 square foot building in here, in, in the city, you'll save about $10,000 a year on that building in Easton. That's because there's a $10,000 subsidy from the business community going to the residents of this city. If we talk about hospitals, many towns would love to have a hospital. In fact, in this city, our number one employer is a hospital, and we have four major health facilities. Our highest wages and our largest sector of employment, not just in Brockton, but the surrounding community, is health care. Those are great jobs, and they provide essential service to us in the, in the need of emergencies and, and medical needs and, and, and take care of those, uh, those needs. In fact, that hospital was created by the business community after the, the huge explosion years ago that injured quite a few people in the city in a manufacturing facility. You know, I, I hear these comments, and, and having been here this many years, I get emotional because I think there's a lack of understanding. And I have offered to the city council uh, to bring together a facilitator with the city council and the department heads to get on a road back to attracting commercial businesses. Because what you have today, folks, is exactly what has happened. You've created an incentive for people to bring housing to the city of Brockton. You've cr also created a disincentive for a business to stay here because there's plenty of places around to save a buck. 
So whether we did it on purpose or not, and I like to think, because I know most of the counselors here, and I've met, met with many of you, and I know many of the residences. Again, I've been here for many, many years. I think everyone wants to do the right thing. I just don't think we're doing it thoughtfully. If we were doing it thoughtfully, we would not be in a situation where you guys are now painted into a corner. You're at 173. You're the highest you can go to is 175, which is very little. You're at a point where you almost can't raise the taxes on the business community anymore. Your valuations on residential are higher than commercial. So this year, you can stay the same, and, and the residents are still going to get a $300 rate increase. I would ask that you stay the same. I would also ask that you take the chamber and the business community up on our offer, up to $10,000 to bring a facilitator in, to bring the department heads in, the city councilors and the leadership in the city, and create a plan that gets us back to a point where we're attracting businesses, we're encouraging those that are here to stay, and we're discouraging, we're discouraging the subsidization of additional residential properties. I would ask that you stay at 173. And I would ask that you take us up on our offer uh, to bring a facilitator in and move this city forward. It's not just tax rates, by the way. It's also water and sewer rates. If you look at the way it's structured, those rates were put into place at a time when Brockton had no water and was trying to discourage businesses from using water. Right now, we have plenty of water, but we've never, never changed the six-tier system. We've asked, the business community has asked repeatedly. We only got to a point where we had to oppose uh, any type of increases just as a kind of a stalemate. But really, folks, let's thoughtfully move forward together. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that come right up to the? Good evening, Mr. President. And I remind you, elected officials, remember in your campaigns when you say, no more taxes. I like to hear that from many of you counselors when you come into office. Uh, I am a business owner. I'm also a board member of the Montello Business Association. And my name is Gregory Belcher, owner of the Waite Funeral Home on the North End in Brockton. Started in 1926. Built that business up, took around that area, beautiful houses. We took some buildings down to beautify the area and get some, some comments at the time. I would love if you would stay at the tax rate of the 173. I'm not just a business owner, I also own some residential property. And what's gonna happen is when you do go up, residential or commercial, rents go up, people leave. People are landlords. They go up on their rent. So we have to be careful of what we do because we're losing good people in the city and we want to keep them here. So again, please, if you could, stay at the 173. And um, Mr. President, Ianeri, you didn't come to our meeting. I know it was Campello Business Association that you did attend. Yes. We do talk amongst the business community, so we do know, you know what many of you counselors stand about. Again, I thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Dennis Hersey, Southern Kenwood Street, Brockton, taxpayer, school teacher for many years. The true Brocktonian and the person who cares the most about the city is the person or family who is drawing a city paycheck and lives here. Not the ones who draw a city paycheck and say goodbye, see you later, at the end of the day. Now, there are a lot of issues here. And I am neither a conservative Republican or a liberal Democrat. I'm very much a moderate and an independent. I see both sides. Too many people are painting the picture of doom and gloom, which you shouldn't. A lot of things are happening. Yeah, we're in a desperate need presently, presently, but it's not gonna be in the future. We have certain city councilors up here who have made it quite clear that the pot shops are gonna bring a lot of revenue to Brockton. Now, I have to disagree with the lady who spoke. I do not think our ordinance committee 
is dragging their feet. There were a lot of issues that needed to be discussed and put in place beforehand. And I think they're doing a good job. I think they're going as fast as they possibly can. There are a lot, a lot of issues on that. And let them finish so that they can do it correctly. Now, one issue that's going on in the city is we give outrageous, and I mean outrageous pay raises and contracts to our city workers. It's got to stop. Also, if you're gonna if you're gonna cut taxes, and I don't think this year you can, I think you're stuck. Because some of you refuse to cut certain spending. You just let the mayor keep creating jobs and creating jobs. How are we ever gonna get a base pay right out like that? You've gotta say at a certain time to the unions, and I know some of you, and I am a unionist, a strong unionist, but you gotta say to them, no, stop. We don't have the money to give you raises for the next two years. Stop. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, stop creating positions. We don't have the money for this. You've got to stop. And, you know, think about this sometime in the future when you're negotiating contracts with the unions. Why not give a more percentage rate to the people who work for the city who live here than the people who don't live here? Maybe give them a 1% or 1.5% to live here. <coughs> now, the other thing about Brockton, the pot shops are gonna bring a lot of money. And if you heard and read, and I read the paper, I read four papers every day, the mayor made a statement recently in the newspaper, which is great. He said that the crime rate is going down in Brockton. Now, the FBI report says we're the third most violent city in the state. So I don't know. The jury's out on that. Also, the mayor said because of Provo, a lot of new businesses are coming to Brockton. Okay, they're dying to get here. Now, I don't know what Bob May's doing and Mr. Jenkins, why they haven't announced it, because if Provo is as successful, and as the mayor said, new business are coming in, we're gonna be in good shape a year from now. The pot shops are gonna bring in $8 million a year. Provo's, all the new business is gonna bring in money, okay? But at the same time, is somebody lying and deceiving the people? Are the pot shops gonna bring in $8 million a year? Is the mayor telling the truth about the crime rate going down? I don't know. Again, the jury's out on that. But the true Brocktonian is a person who lives here, who cares about the city, pays their taxes in the city, and lives in the city. People, we, you people, never ever cut city budgets, departmental budgets. And you, honestly, you've got to start thinking that way. Whether it's a two, three percent cut per year, and you don't have to do it every year, maybe once every three years. You've got to cut the budget. You have to say to the department heads, look, it, that doesn't mean they're cutting personnel. It may mean they're cutting overtime. It may be cutting other things. We have to. And I also want to defend something. Our police department's getting pounded into the ground. And that's not fair. They are 25 police officers short for the population of this city. We have four fire trucks that don't work. Come on. We, you're turning your back on public safety. Some of the money that you're taking, more money has got to be put into public safety, honestly. You, if, if we do have that much violence, and you know we do, okay? More money has got to be put into public safety. And, you know, I don't know what is fair, what's not fair. Businesses want to stay here, but if you hit, keep hitting them, they're going to leave. People, residents want to stay here, but if you keep hitting them for money, they're going to leave too. You really got to look at the unions right now. You've really got to look at the city jobs. You've got to say stop on the contracts because they're getting, it's really out of hand. And the other thing is, if you look at what they get, the retirees in the city, the benefits they get, it's unbelievable, unbelievable what they're getting. So in the future, you have to think about the cutting. I mean, not to have cut 21st century, come on, to create jobs in the police department. That job that was in the police department, you could have put two cops on the street, come on. Let common sense prevail. We, we are in desperate need of money, but if the mayor's on the level about crime going down, about all these new businesses coming in because of Provo, this time next year we're gonna be sitting, we're gonna be sitting on so much money, be walking on gold on the streets. And the pot shops, what they're gonna do, the revenue they're gonna bring in, oh, it's gonna be unbelievable. But is it true? Again, the jury's out on that, I don't know. But. Right now, you've got to look at budget cuts. You've got to stop the unions from all their, 
all the <laughs> what they want because it's not happening. We don't have the money to keep giving, giving, giving. We're going under. The ship is sinking, and at the rate we're going, if we could be in receivership in four or five years, the state could be coming in and taking it over. So we've got to start thinking about cutting budgets in city, in city departments and saying no to the unions. And also, why not give somebody who lives here and pay taxes here a little bit more money on contracts than those who don't want to live here? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. How are you? This is London Hall. I own property at 95 Tremont Street. 33 years here in this city. Uh, been this man off and on 10 to 20 years. Um, my understanding, how did the elephant get in the room? Uh, is that from um, school deficits? You know, I read the paper, it says we $10 million in debt with the school. Is that passed on to us? I know we have to pay a certain amount of taxes for schools, water, and all the facilities. I'm just wondering, is this why we are being increased because that particular, we're not getting to meet why this is happening to us. You know, I've been paying, I, like you said, I have seen people. I think if this continues to go on, a lot of people will lose their homes. I was here since 85, I seen it happen. And I see it on the rise again, the same systems, the same type of uh, atmosphere is beginning to happen again. A lot of people don't see it, but old times like me that have been here for 33 years, I see it. And like I said, the elephant is still in the room. He's not going to go away. We got to find a way to get rid of it. And I think you all know who I'm talking about. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to be heard, please come forward and state your name to the clerk. Anyone else that's wishes to be heard in regards to this issue that we have before us this evening. Hearing else, because I'm going to declare the hearing closed and then we'll, go ahead, ma'am. Coming around, fine, go ahead. Hi, Elaine Donovan, 42 Thatcher Square. Yes. I'd like to make one additional comment um, to what I had uh, already spoke on before and also in response to this gentleman's comments regarding the pace at which Brockton is going and finalizing uh, retail marijuana. I don't know if you can see this on my phone. Whoops. But this is a map of Massachusetts and all the towns and cities which, as of a few weeks ago, this was on the news a few weeks ago, have final or provisional licenses issued for retail marijuana. Attleboro, Fall River, Plymouth, Wareham, Brookline, Uxbridge, of course, like Leiters, Hudson, Ayer, Lowell, Salem, Greenfield, Montague, Northampton, East Hampton, Oxford, Great Barrington, Pittsfield, etc. And I recently read that Taunton has finalized their ordinances and zoning months ago and is set to probably start opening retail maybe as early as January. So another concern with the delay in uh, doing what Brockton needs to do to get this business in the city is that I don't believe the state is just going to be issuing unlimited licenses and the longer we take the more this, this map is going to fill in and we could lose out forever if we don't get off our butts and make this happen. Also, if you can see this, conspicuous by its absence is anything right here smack in the middle of the South Shore. There's a big gaping hole exactly where Brockton is. So please do it, you know, and I understand that your concern with this meeting may be the 
uh, allotting the percentage of the residential versus uh, business tax rates in those proportions. But um, I would say to, and I also know that Mayor Carpenter already approved a 2.5% increase in the tax base. I feel like this council, you could reject that and keep the taxes as they are and not raise our taxes and let's start working on bringing money in, not just bleeding the taxpayers dry, especially the homeowners, and it's bad for the business too. So I just wanted to follow up with that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anyone else that wishes to be heard? Anyone else wishes to be heard in regards to this matter before us this evening? And I'm going to declare the uh, hearing closed at this time. The hearing is closed. At this um, point in time, we do have our, our financial officer here, Mr. Condon, and we also have Mr. Christopher Pike here from the tax assessor's office, which will uh, come up and make their um, the presentation. There's only just a couple of things, just a couple of pointers I just want to point out. And um, uh, whether I'm out of order or not, I'll, I'll decide that myself. But. Um, people need to also realize, and, and we also know the situation in, in the unions and all of that and what they've received over the years, but people have to remember the city council does not negotiate contracts. We are not negotiators. We just appropriate the funds to make everything work, and it's up to the mayor and his team that has to do the negotiations. It's not easy. School department, school committee is a different ballgame. When I was on the school committee, you were a negotiator. You sat there. But as a city council, we do not do that. So I just want to—I want to clarify that. So uh, we have every right to go as councils to the mayor and indicate where we may think he should be. But still, that's his team that does it, and we listen at the end because the contract comes to us, and we're put in a position where we have to do what's in the best interest of the city. And I think the best interest of the city is, is making sure that we keep the level of services that we have, because that's where there'd be a problem if we didn't. Um, pay them enough, then we'd have a situation that, you know, services wouldn't be met. So I just want to say that as a city council president and as, and as a counselor and, and to protect my counselors because, um, you know, our job is uh, legislative and, and it's not all of what everyone thinks it should be where we can just go out and, and, and change everything and change the inside of how money's come into the, come into the city. But um, with that being said, uh, Mr. Condon, um, I don't know if you want to come up and Oh, uh, was Chris uh, coming up first? Yep. Mr. President. Councilor Sullivan. Just while you're clarifying, you, you might want to just inform everybody here that when the mayor presents the budget, the 2.5% is already in it. Exactly. So the, the budget that was ratified in the early part of the summer, the 2.5% increase is already in there vis-a-vis <coughs> -vis the, the mayor's budget. So I just want to make sure people are clear on that. And we can clarify the fact that when he was elected, he always said that he would not raise it to the 2.5%, which the first year he didn't. But he found out after, and I give Mr. Condon that credit, that you cannot just stay where you want to stay because if you want to keep the level of services for the city of Brockton, you've got to go up to that 2.5%. I think... I think with some of the comments that have been said, Council, and you probably agree this evening, I mean, you, you know, if we stay where we are, and I said it, newspaper article, I got the article right here, what I said at Camp Pello, you're still going to see an uptick. Because why? Your valuations on your homes are up. Homes are selling in this city, and new people are moving in. I can't stop it. I'm not going to stop it. You know, if somebody came and wanted to offer me 10000 more than what I, I would be offered if I was selling my house, there goes my name. I mean, why wouldn't I? I'd, I'd be a fool not to, you know, but that's what's happening, and we need to understand that. But some people just don't want to understand it. But in any case, Chris, thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, Councillors. Uh, the purpose of this hearing is to establish the proportion of the tax levy raised by the residential and commercial classes of property as required under Massachusetts general laws. The assessed values for fiscal year 2019 represent the estimate of market value as of January 1st, 2018, utilizing verified sales data from calendar year 2017. Assessments re represent 100% of market value. The Department of Revenue has certified the real and personal property values for the city as well as the new growth in value. The assessors are required to fairly assess 27,620 parcels in the city. Of those, 24,256 are residential, 
1,737 are commercial. Industrial parcels, 1,627. I'm sorry, 1,737 commercial and industrial. And personal property is 1,627. The total taxable value of all real and personal property in the city for the fiscal year 2018 I'm sorry, that's supposed to be 2019, is 7.84 billion, which is a 9.34% increase from fiscal year 2018. This year, the city added a total of 2.368 million in new growth tax dollars to, in the residential, commercial, and personal property. The median single family assessed value for fiscal year 2019 has increased 11.67% to $261,200. The median two-family assessed value increased 13.39% to $331,450. The median three-family assessed value has increased 12.23% to $387,700. Whereas the median commercial assessed value for fiscal year 2019 only increased 1.02% to 240,750 and the median industrial assessed value increased 1.03% to 254,300. People often associate rising assessments with rising taxes. However, this is not the case. Rising budgets cause rising taxes. If the budget increases, typically taxes increase. If the budget decreases, typically taxes decrease. The assessed value represents the market value of the property. The City Council has this hearing to adopt a residential factor and decide how much of the tax levy the, levy the owners of residential properties will pay versus that of owners of commercial, industrial, and personal property. This decision necessitates two tax rates or a split rate. The split rate in the city of Brockton taxes commercial and industrial and personal property at a higher rate than residential properties. If there were no shift, there would be one rate and based upon this year's levy, the single rate for the city would be $18.32 per thousand dollar valuation. If the council decided on a single rate, the median single family tax bill would increase $1,029. The median two family tax bill would increase $1,378. And the median three family tax bill would increase $1,538. The, the median commercial tax bill would decrease $3,436. And the median industrial tax bill would decrease $3,536. Last year, the City Council voted to set the fiscal year 2018 shift factor at 1.73. This meant that for fiscal year 2018, commercial, industrial, and personal property, while representing 18.34% of the total taxable value, paid 31.73% of the total taxes. Brockton continues to have the lowest average single family tax bill of the surrounding towns based upon fiscal year 2018 data. The average single family bill was 3,920 and represented a $300 increase over the fiscal year 2017 average bill. The average tax bill in the city was $1,143 lower than the average bill of the contiguous towns around Brockton. Thank you, and I'll now answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Chris. Anybody have any council follow? I just have a couple of uh, hopefully easy questions just to get on the record, and this is, uh, I, I was surprised at the amount of exempt property, Mr. Pike. Uh, or Mr. Condon, one billion, one hundred and eighteen million, fifty-eight thousand, two hundred dollars in exempt property. I, I'm going to assume some of that is state-owned, some is city-owned. Combination of state-owned, 
city owned and, and properties that are, that are neither, but are exempt from real estate taxation. For example, the Brockton Hospital property. Yeah. Uh, I think, for example, DW Field Park is a substantial part of the city. Neighborhood that's Health exempt. Center. All the school, that's right, the Neighborhood Health Center. All the school properties are exempt from taxation. The churches are exempt from taxation. So it is, it's about, I think, about an eighth of the city's value, or, or maybe even a little bit more, that's exempt. All right. The reason I mention that, I don't disagree with what Mr. Cooney said about how uh, the business community, uh, in some respects, subsidizes residential properties. But we provide services to these exempt tax exempt properties. I mean, we answer police calls, fire calls, we do inspections. We, I mean, we do, could we do more? Yes, but we do a lot for the business community. Um, I will say to my colleagues, I'm worried tonight because when people receive their tax bills and there is an increase, whatever it is, they only have two payments to make up the arrearage. And for some people, that's tough. I mean, if your if your bill goes up five hundred dollars, you're going to have to do two fifty and two fifty. You're not going to be able to spread it out one hundred and twenty five per quarter, and and that worries me. Uh, the, the last question I have uh, for Mr. Pike, and if you can't answer it tonight, perfectly all right. But the assessed value is supposed to be the fair market value, which is the price at which a willing seller and a willing buyer would consummate the deal. Am I, am I right? Yes, that? arm's length sales. Uh, yes, yeah, an arm's length sales. There was a parcel of land on Crescent Street that we valued at $927,000. It sold for $1.4 million. We valued it at nine twenty-seven in 2017, which would have been as of January 1st, 2016. It sold for, for $1.4 million, and it's still on the rolls, but it's only up to 962000 And I mean, I'll give you the address after the meeting, but I don't understand how someone is willing to pay that kind of money and be able to borrow that kind of money from a bank, which presumably is going to do some due diligence, and then turn around and, and have the valuation so low. And I, I guess my point is, colleagues, I just want to make sure that we're getting what we should be in terms of fair market values assigned and revenues collected. And I've, I've started a spreadsheet on commercial, residential, and uh, it, it's pretty enlightening as to how a lot of sales are going through at a much higher amount. I mean, significantly, 50, 60, 70 percent higher than we're assessing. And I think, uh, I think that might be worth a, a look at a future meeting. But, and lastly, I will say, and I've heard it here tonight, I agree, I, we don't have any room to move. I mean, it's at 173, and I mean, unless someone's going to suggest putting more of a burden on homeowners, I don't see where we can go. Because the sad fact is, in this city, we have people that live paycheck to paycheck. There are people who are just a couple of hundred dollars a month away from not being able to afford to live in the city. And you could have all of the greatest businesses in the world, but if you don't have a customer base, then you really don't have anything. So, and thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor. <coughs> Councils, any other? Which Council Sullivan? Thank you, Mr. Pike. Good evening. Good evening. To see you through the camera. So thank you very much to you, Mr. O'Donnell, and your staff for preparing this. I mean, I've been on the council 13 years, and this is probably one of the uh, most detailed. So thank you for your efforts on that. In, in, in terms of the uh, what we call the cheat sheet here, with the yellow highlight, if if you go to uh, the 173 percent, which is the 1.73 factor, as as currently. I just want to make sure, and, and I concur with what was stated here. I mean, we, we're in a tough situation. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, we're all taxpayers. Everybody that sits up here, even though we're elected officials, we pay our taxes, and it's not the most pleasant thing to do, but unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a necessary evil. The 1.73, though, I just want to make sure I understand this. So if, if, if that's what's approved, the, the residential tax rate would be $15.55 per thousand? Right, that's for the median um, uh, assessed valuation for each uh, section at the top. Yep, top and then the on the second page, the average would be the same, 15.55. Right. And then, and then on the commercial industrial, that would be 31.69. Right. Now, it, even though if we keep it at the same, it, it's somewhat of a misnomer because, again, taxes are going to increase due to, to the, the values. But is that, is that what that 305.23 means for a single family under the medium? That would be the average increase for a median value property, right? Okay. Single family. Okay. And on the commercial side and the industrial would be 
about a drop of uh, commercial sites, two hundred sixteen dollars and twenty three cents on the on the medium. Yes. And one hundred thirty five point seven five on the industrial. Correct. I mean, councils again. I, I I this is the worst part of the job every year trying to set the factor, um, but I just want to make it clear that people understand this because I didn't know this before I got in on the city council. When the budget's approved, the increase is already in there. So this factor um, does, does create a misnomer, but at the end of the day, we, we can't really go up on it. It's going to really hurt the residential people in the city of Brockton, and that's who vote us in. So I concur with you, Wynn. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Councilor. Any Council Rodriguez? Yes. Council Rodriguez? I'm turning the thing on. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yes. Um, Mr. Pike, how are you? Very well, I, thank um, you. Last year, I remember asking Mr. O'Donnell to give us, um, we actually got uh, this sheet here that basically talks about the average single family tax bill in the surrounding communities. And it actually talked about the dollar amounts. Uh, I had actually asked them last year to provide us, because I know we're, we're talking about tax rate, uh, you know, comparing uh, residential versus businesses, but we don't have one of these that actually compares the dollar amount of businesses versus residents. Because for, for the other towns, you mean? Yes. Some of the towns don't have a shift. Some of them have the same rate. Uh, would it be, the shift would be 100%, meaning the tax rate would be the same for commercial and industrial. But yes, you're right. No, I'm, what I'm saying is that just like you basically say, the average family, uh, single family bill in Brockton comes up to about the $3,600. And when you compare it, for instance, to an Eastern, it's $6,700. Right. Uh, I, what I what was looking for is for you to say the average the uh, commercial tax in Brockton is $5,000 versus Easton, who is $1,000. Do you see what I'm saying? I do. The dollar amount itself. I do. Because what happens, uh, and bear with me for a second here, because what I, what I end up seeing is that the, the tax rates in the city or the taxes in the city are subsidized by the residents, where 70 to 80% of your total taxes comes from residents versus about 11 to 12 percent from businesses. So even though you're saying that those rates in businesses are higher than the uh, residents, the residents are subsidizing the, uh, the tax pool. And sometimes we get a sense that although, I mean, you can go up 50 percent of $10 is $5, or I can give you, you know, 10% of a million dollars is, a hundred, you know, it's basically $100,000. You know, so it's, it's, the numbers aren't really all, it's not equivalent in the sense. Because if you had, let's say if 50% of your taxes came from businesses and 50% came from uh, residents, then I think we can make that argument that the numbers are skewed one way or the other. But I think the residents are so much higher than actually business is that sometimes we kind of get away from the fact that we think that the commercial uh, businesses are the bulk of the taxes that we receive in the city when in fact it's coming from the taxpayers. Right, actually the uh, commercial properties, the valuations have dropped about five and a half percent in the last five years. The total valuation compared to residential. And the residential have gone up. Right, exactly. So they represent a more of an increase in the values. So your point is well made. I, I understand what you're saying. I apologize we didn't have that this year. Yeah. But, that one, list you wanted. but the reason why I'm bringing this up is because even looking at the chart in the, uh, in the 173 percent that you know, the city is actually recommending, and I'm glad the president actually caught that, that it's not, it's not our rates. I mean, these are basically what we are presented with, and we, make the, we, we have to make a decision, either accept this, lower it, or, or actually increase it. And if you look at the, where the lowering will be, I think we have two percentage points that we can go, uh, and whereas the increases have a greater range in the sense. Well, that's so, right. That's because you're up against a 1.75 uh, shift, which, are, which is mandated. You can't go beyond you that. You can't go beyond that. Right. So, but the reason why I'm saying that is if when you look at, even if you stay at, one, uh, at 173, the businesses are getting <coughs> a cut. 
In some cases, the commercial will get a $403.88 cut, whereas a single family is getting uh, a jolt of about $285. Do you see that? I do. So even if you brought it down to just one peck, one percentage point, the businesses are still getting a $200, $290 cut. And yet, on the, on the residential side, they'll get around a $10 cut. So they're getting a cut, but on the residential side, the residents are paying $275, which is technically uh, $10 less than what that rate would have been. Right. So the, the residents are still paying more, and the businesses that are getting a cut. Uh, well, it, it represents a change from last year is what it is, but yeah. you're right. That's because the residential values are much more higher this year, and it just works out the numbers that way. If you adopt 1.73, just because it's highlighted doesn't mean that's what anyone has to decide. No, about. no, I, under I understand that, but I'm yeah. just saying that when you look at it, you know, we're telling our citizens, some of, uh, some of whom actually spoke here tonight, that we're, we're going to increase your taxes by $285, and I'm going to give um, Good Samaritan um, a credit of 400 bucks. Right. You know, that's, that's what we're, we're stuck with. Well, it, keep in mind, that's true. But they also say, well, we're paying a tax rate of, you know, 31.69 if you adopt this. I understand that. But yeah. what I'm saying is that as far as they're concerned, they're getting a $400 cut when some of the residents, or myself as a taxpayer as well, is getting an increase of $295. Right. That would be the case this year, yes. That would be the case. You may want to take an opportunity to recess before they get into another. I'm done with my question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Councilors, at, at this point in time, it's uh, about 7.03 p.m., and we have a finance meeting uh, scheduled for this time. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the special city council meeting in a recess. We're going to do our finance uh, business, which shouldn't take us more than about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll come back to... Uh, open uh, this up for uh, discussion. So at this time, I'm going to I'm going to put this uh, meeting, the special city council, um, into a recess. We'll just take a quick recess just to switch over to finance. Call the meeting of the finance uh, subcommittee for the city council to order for Monday evening, December the third, 2018. And we have three, four items before us, which are public hearings. I believe it's four. Am I correct? Yeah. Four items before us in regards to. Uh, the streets. Madam Clerk, would you please read the uh, first item? Order that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Baldwin Road, extending from Colgate Road westerly and northerly to Vale Street. For that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out a public street away of said, of said city of Brockton. Favorable in planning on October 2nd, 2018, invited Rob May, Director of Planning, Larry Rowley, Commissioner. You do understand she has, doesn't have to do that. You just open the meeting, then you recess it, and then you go back to the special meeting. You don't have to read that entire agenda. Are we going to go back to the other You recessed meeting. it. You recess this one. But the other meeting is a special meeting. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go back to that one. Do you have to? At the end of this one. The end of finance. No, you don't go through this complete. You want to go through complete finance? It's only four right? items. That's all it is. Oh, well, you're kidding. Well, go ahead. But that's it's only four it. items. That's, okay, that's, that's what it's. Yeah, it's, it's just four streets. And what's it going to be? The, it's a yes and a no. I'm going to get it over. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Get it. Yeah, I'm going to go back. All right, time having arrived, I declare the hearing open in regards to this matter here. If there's anybody here in favor of. Uh, in regards to the street being, um, um, I believe, uh, set up as a public public way, please come forward and state your name and address to the clerk. Is anyone here in favor of? We are, what are we do? Mr. Commissioner, how are you? Good evening, Councilors. I'm Larry Rowley, DPW Commissioner, and we don't have any problems with this request. Okay, great. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else here in favor of? 
See, not to declare that part of the hearing closed. Anybody here in opposition? Anyone here in opposition too? Seeing that, I declare the hearing closed. Council O'Lally? I move to recommend this favorably. Second. Motion been made and seconded to recommend this favorably back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed goes back to the full city council rec with a favorable recommendation. And I just want to highlight, Mr. May did contact me today. He had a uh, different uh, schedule uh, for this evening, so he couldn't be here. That's why he's not present. But item number two, Madam Clerk ordered that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Boundary Circle, extending from Randolph Ave, easterly and northerly, to Brookville Avenue. For that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way of said city of Brockton, favorable in planning on October 2nd, 2018, invited Rob May, Director of Planning, Larry Rowley, Commissioner, Department of Public Works. I declare the hearing open. If there's somebody here in favor of, please come forward and state your name and address to the clerk. Larry Riley, DPW Commissioner. We don't have any problems with this request. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Anyone else? No. Anyone else that's uh, uh, here in favor of wants to, wants to be heard? Please come forward. Seeing none, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Anybody here in opposition? Anyone here in opposition? Seeing that, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Council Lally. Motion recommend favorably. Motion has been made and seconded. Recommend favorably. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council. Thank you. Item number three, Madam Clerk. Ordered that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Braintree Avenue, extending from Boundary Circle, westerly and northerly to Brookville Avenue, a distance of about 600.48 feet. And for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way of said city of Brockton, favorable in planning on October 2nd, 2018. Invited Rob May, Director of Planning, Larry Rowley, Commissioner, Department of Public Works. At this time, I declare the hearing open on, on this particular street as well. Anybody here in favor, please come forward. Call Let the commissioner. I called your clerk before, but a commissioner, I'm sorry. That's, I've been called worse. I, uh, <laughs> we, won't, we won't go. Larry there. Raleigh, DPW Commission, we have no problems with this request. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there anyone else here present that wishes to be heard on the street in favor of? See none, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Anybody here in opposition? Anyone here in opposition? Seeing that, nobody here, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Councilor Lally. Motion to recommend favorably. Motion was made and seconded to recommend. Favorably all in favor. Opposed goes back to the full city council. Favorable recommendation. Item number four, last item. Ordered that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Vale Street, extending from Norwich Road westerly to Upton Street, a distance of about 636.65 feet. And for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way of said city of Brockton, favorable in planning on October 2nd, 2018. Invited Rob May, Director of Planning, Larry Rowley, Commissioner, Department of Public Works. This time I declare the hearing open in regards to this particular street. Right. Anyone here wishes to be heard in favor of, please? Larry Riley, DBW Commissioner, we have no problems with this request. Thank you. Anyone else that wishes to be heard in favor of, please come forward, state your name to the clerk. Seeing none, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Anybody here in opposition? Seeing none, I declare that part of the hearing closed. Council Lally? Chair, I uh I want to thank you all, everyone, everyone here, uh, for uh, indulging, indulging me for this quick little meeting. Uh, all these, all these items. I'm sorry about the interruption, but uh, motion to recommend Second. favorably. Motion was made and seconded to recommend favorably to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council. And that's enough streets for a year. You're done. That's it. <laughs> Want to bet? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll watch. Trust me. <laughs> Only three weeks left. Any other, any other business to come before the finance committee? Seeing that, I declare the Finance Committee adjourned. I'm going to take a minute, a minute recess. Anyone that needs to leave, then we're going to go right back uh, to City Special City Council. Okay, councilors, recess is concluded. We are back to the Special uh, City Council meeting in regards to uh, the setting of the tax rate. Councilor Sullivan. Mr. President, I, I just, I, while we're back in recess, I, I think Councilor Rodriguez said some, some good statements, and I, and I know they were uh, stated last year as well. And, I would like uh, the CFO to kind of um, speak on that because sure. I, I want to verify some of that information. If you could, Mr. Conant, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so the 
the position you're in basically is being driven by three things. One, you approve spending at the beginning of the process, as Councilor Sullivan said, the assumption that the Proposition 2.5% two and and levy increase was in the budget was known at that time. That was the budget that was submitted. It had revenue assumptions in there, and that money is spent. So this is not the time to cut the budget. Those appropriations are in place. You're not able to do that. The, re the suggestions that have been made with respect to budget cuts and appropriation control in the future, they all have merit to them. They're a process that can be embarked on in the next budget, including collective bargaining. If the city wants to take a more, more stringent position with its unions, that's always a possibility at the bargaining table. But at this point, the appropriations are set in stone. We need to approve, and so is the levy, by the way. Uh, the levy is what it is. It, it, that number is already set in stone. It's into the Department of Revenue already, based on the other revenues of the city, which were already appropriated by you in the budget process. You knew what the free cash was. So now the only decision you're really making is, of that levy, how much of it is going to be apportioned to the commercial tax base, and how, mu how much of it to the residential tax base. And you've already had a pretty good description of what your dilemma is there. You're at a factor of 1.73. You're not allowed by law, which means that the residential, or rather the uh, commercial values are being increased, increased by 173 percent to raise up their share of the property taxes that are going to be loved <coughs> in the city. That's a big factor as it is. That was the, I'm not sure if Chris is still here, Chris Cooney. Chris Cooney, the other Chris. I think, there he is, way in the back. So he's right. There is a substantial benefit being provided to the citizens' residents by the fact that you've got a significantly sized commercial tax base here in the city, which you're allowed to tap into to diminish the impact on the residents. But you're go you've gone about as far in that as you can. You're about 1.73. So I think, so there, there's the, the real factor that's killing you on all of this, I think, is this. If you look in this package, about in the middle of it, there's a form that gets submitted to the Department of Revenue. It's called an LA-4. And it shows you that there isn't an awful lot of difference from one year to the next in the number of parcels that are being assessed. That doesn't tell you that there's a lot of growth from new development occurring. That's a problem. And in addition to that, the values that are on the commercial properties are almost flat. They aren't going up in any significant way at all. That's a problem. The values that are on the residential segment are going up at a pretty rapid rate, and there's not much we can do about that. Uh, Councilor Yarnieri mentioned that. We're in the control of a market force which is going on because of mainly, I think, residential property values in the Boston area, which are becoming unaffordable, and people are moving out, and they make Brockton's values pretty attractive to them. It's still a city where there are a fairly high number of services offered compared to other communities for a pretty reasonable price if you are a homeowner. You may find the tax increase to be difficult to stomach. I'm not talking about the ability of any particular taxpayer to handle that tax increase. That depends upon an individual's pers personal circumstances and some of these folks may be up against it with the ability to pay a $200 or a $300 increase and Councilor Farwell made a good point. That bill comes due in two bills, not over four. So those are all difficulties, but there's not much we can do about the residential market factors that are driving up our residential prices. The only thing we can do is to do as much as we can to get new business development into the city so you see fewer tax rate hearings where the parcel count on commercial businesses is remaining about the same. That's not easy in Brockton. You've got a pretty much fully built city. There's not a lot of available land. One reason we're different from Easton is Easton has land that can be developed, and that's why they don't have to have a split rate. They can throw additional land out there far farther south in the city. I don't think Middleborough has a split rate. We have a split rate because we have a need to move taxation off residences, and we don't have many parcels left to develop. On the other hand, there's a, com um, a common complaint about tax increment financing, and I think that's because people don't understand the structure of tax increment financing. When we give away a tax increment financing plan or, or negotiate it with a business, we're doing it because we think we need to make that concession in order to incent new development into the city. The concession isn't permanent, it goes away in time, and the taxes that are being paid on that property at the beginning are the same as they were before the incentive was put in place. So you're not losing taxes. You're giving away a share of the future taxes in order to make the development happy, uh, happen, rather, and then hopefully in 10 years or 15 years, the full value of that increment is coming into the city. I think there, 
They're tough to swallow at, at a particular time, but we're a city without an awful lot of available land. We need whatever tools we have at our disposal to make those, those increases happen. And I, I think they're worth looking at um, with a hard kind of negotiation, but I, I think they're also worth doing on a case-by-case -case basis as you see that they're helpful to the city. You want more commercial development in the city. You want it in a place where it doesn't too badly affect the residences that are already living there, which goes to the comment I think that the, uh, the lady, the first person to speak tonight, was talking how some property changes affect the residents that are in the area. I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. But we do need more commercial development, and that'd be my, that would be my strongest recommendation, is, and it's been that for years. If you want to have more growth in the city, pro provide for your services without getting into fights with your unions, and reduce the impact on the residences, the answer to that is commercial tax-based growth. That's, that's the way that happens. Uh, my recommendation for tonight is that I think you all have alluded to it. You don't have any room to move. If you want to have help the average residential taxpayer at all, the best you can do is a two percentage increase from 173 to 175. It doesn't make an awful lot of difference if you do that. If you adopt a factor of 173, you're already helping businesses. Their tax rate might be higher than they like, but most of them are going to see tax bill decreases. So I think stay where you are be my recommendation. If you move at all, it can only go to 1.75. And I'd be happy to take the questions. I know some of you may have some. Thank you, Mr. Conan. Any, anyone have any questions? Mr. Conan, Council Cruz. Actually, more of a comment, and my comments are pretty much I've been making them, how many years we've been on this council? <laughs> For about 13 years we've been making the same comments, and some of it is we all see the same information, and I think sometimes we look at it differently. Uh, my argument has been for years that by helping the businesses, we're helping the citizens, we're helping the homeowners in the city, Part of the reason the property the commercial property values have stayed flat is because we are not attracting businesses who are going in and trying to look at these businesses, these properties to buy them. Because the, the surrounding towns have a lower rate and can, can offer such, uh, such a, uh, a, a lower tax rate, a tax burden to these, to these businesses, they look and if their tax bill is gonna be $40,000 a year in Easton and $80,000 a year in Brockton, they're going to build in Easton and they're going to buy property in Easton. So we are already in behind the eight ball because we have a smaller amount of property anyways. <laughs> the other argument I think we need to sometimes think about is for every Good Samaritan Hospital that's paying $2.8 million, we have most of our businesses are mom and pop businesses in the city. And the, when we raise that, that number or, or don't drop that number, we are sometimes putting some of those businesses, we talk all the time about the homeowner who can't afford, we are very often putting citizen businesses in the city, or maybe they're not citizen businesses, maybe they're people that live out of town, but employ people in the city, and in many cases, we're putting them behind the eight ball. I had somebody talk to me tonight about a, a, a very good business that I know in the city that has had pr problems in the past paying their tax bill. Every time we make that tax bill harder for them to pay, we <coughs> hurt our homeowners. And the other part that I think sometimes we don't remember is the tax burden stays the same. If next year we have 20 less businesses paying that tax burden, the homeowners are picking up that, that extra dollar. The dollar amount isn't going to change. It changes as we grow the, the, the budget. But if, if right now those businesses are paying one point, they, we're adding 73% to the value of their business, of their property, to subsidize the homeowner, and that's what we're doing. Every time we lose one of those businesses or don't attract a new business, the homeowner is actually picking up that dollar value. So we're, by not attracting businesses, we are actually hurting that homeowner. So we look and, and we look short term and, and with blinders on sometimes and say, oh, we can't afford to, we, we need to drop that residential tax rate. Oftentimes by not dropping the commercial tax rate, we are actually hurting the homeowner. And I've been arguing this for years, and I know it's difficult. I just look at my own tax bill and say, wow, that went up. You know, and when we, we'll get the calls, by the way, and but they'll start the day after the first tax bill goes out, and we'll get the calls and say, you raised taxes. Yeah, we raised them back in June, by the way, when, when we did the budget. But yes, we raised taxes because your property is worth that much more on top of things. But my bill went up too, and I don't like it. But we have that's 
that's what goes with being a homeowner. I'm just, I, I, I won't make a motion tonight to drop the 173 down, although I wish we had started years ago to go down a percentage each year so there would be less of a burden. But we cannot afford to go up near that 175 ceiling for two reasons. One is it sends a terrible message when you're out trying to attract businesses, but also it leaves us nowhere if we ever had a fiscal emergency. If we get to a year where we literally are, we have nowhere to go, we don't have anywhere to go in that case. We ha at least right now we have a small cushion to go to if we needed to in another fiscal year. So please don't think about putting it up to 1.74, 1.75. And again, I pr would prefer, I think we're doing the homeowners a disservice by not starting to drop that down. But I know that uh, the will isn't there for that. But my, my yearly lecture on that item, so... Thank you, Mr. President. You're welcome, Councilor. Council Borgard. Thank you, Mr. President. I just uh, want to ask Chris Pike if uh, he could just let people know. I mean, I myself don't want to penalize the businesses. I don't want to penalize the residents. And I don't like when it always focuses on our union contracts. It's not the only thing that costs more. And no one ever says, oh, can't wait to have less of my paycheck. No one says that. So, I mean, if we're going to get people to do a job, et cetera. And unions aren't perfect, but at the same time, we can't compare ourselves to these other communities. That always gets me frustrated. They don't have three hospitals. They don't have the fourth largest school system. They don't have the infrastructure that we have. So it really is impossible. I mean, maybe if we were in Bristol County, you know, you could compare Fall River to New Bedford or something. We have no city to compare ourselves to. So we're at a loss right there. I am in complete agreement with many people that said this evening that we need to become more, you know, how would I say, have more conversation and interaction and invite businesses into the community. I want to stress positive businesses. And uh, as far as our residential, you know, uh, how would I say, all of a sudden this desire to build an apartment every square foot in this city needs to, how would I say, be revisited. But the reason I ask, Mr. Pike, thank you, and uh, you had your team here and a couple of other individuals with, um, I'm sorry, um, CFO, um, uh, Mr. Condon, is um, that we have abatements, exemptions, and et cetera. And that is for individuals veterans, dis disability, uh, seniors, if I'm forgetting anyone, I apologize. But I want to ask you at this point, there's any opportunity where there could be more conversation and availability for individuals to assist those in need of such services? For exemptions, you mean? Uh, exemptions right. and other, you know, other such yeah, abatements. Yes. Right. Our office does um, offer those to people who come in and ask for them, or call up and ask for them. We have a team of um, uh, personnel that handles that specifically and we can take applications every year uh, there's certain times if you want to call our office directly we, and we that can get is the number I, I don't have it off the top of my Whoa, head okay. <laughs> I don't you call the yourself. number I'm sorry <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's on our website and it's in the sure. phone book I can tell you that okay all right thank you very much yes. okay. thank, thank you. you thank you council councilors I, I think it's time for us to entertain some type of a motion so that we can move forward councilor Cruz motion to uh, set the factor at 1.73. Motion has been made and second that we will set yes. the file or any other questions on the motion? Seeing none, motion was made and second that we will keep the factor at the 1.73%. Um, by a roll call vote, Madam Clerk? ASAC? Yes. Beauregard? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Darrancourt? Yes. Ian Airy? Yes. Farwell? Yes. Lally? Yes. Monaghan? Yes. Nicastro? Yes. Rodriguez? No. Sullivan? Yes. That's 10 in the affirmative, 1 in the negative. And the order is uh, adopted. At, at this time, uh, we're going to take a quick recess so, so that we can do the uh, back to route. Reconsideration hopes does not prevail. Motion been made and seconded for reconsideration hopes does not prevail. All in favor of reconsideration? All opposed? Jay wants to speak. Reconsideration fails. After the uh, yes, math come. has been calculated. Yeah, so. we're just going to take a quick <coughs> few-minute recess so she can do what she has to do, and then we'll be back. Reopen the meeting of the uh, Special City Council. At this point in time, Mr. Clerk, you read the order, please. Okay. In Council, December 3rd, 2018, ordered that the City Council hereby determines the percentages of the local tax levy in accordance with the provisions of national laws, Chapter 40, Section 56, 
to be borne by each class of real property as defined in Section 2A of Chapter 59 and personal property. Residential, 70.30. Commercial, 20.62. Industrial, 3.56. Personal property, 5.52. The fact of such classification shall be 1.73. Do I have a motion? Second. Motion was made and second to approve. All in favor? Opposed? <laughs> it's been approved. What is adopted? Oh, one. No. Should we make a roll call? Yeah. Okay, do a roll call. Yeah, yeah. do a roll call on it. ASAC? Yes. Beauregard? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Darrencourt? Yes. Ian Erie? Yes. Farwell? Yes. Yeah. Lally? Yes. Monahan? Yes. Nicastro? Yes. Rodriguez? Still a no. Sullivan? <laughs> yes. That's ten in the affirmative, one in the negative. The order is adopted. Motion for reconsideration and hopes it does not prevail. Second. Second. Motion been made and second for reconsideration and hopes it does not prevail. All in favor of reconsideration? All opposed? Reconsideration fails. Any other business to come before us this evening? Seeing none, we'll be here next Monday evening at 7 o'clock p.m. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>